I invite you to turn your Bibles or your electronic devices to the book of Luke chapter 19. We're going to hang out and just uh, hear from God through the book of Luke. Luke, as you're finding your way there, let me take a second and thank you guys for joining us this weekend. I'm Pastor Tom Atkinson. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Fellowship. Uh, pastor Charlie's out this weekend. He'll be back next weekend to continue the This Is Us series. Y'all enjoying the This Is Us series? Yes. Amen. Uh, speaking of the this, uh, uh, this Is Us series, I've been asked to remind you that we do have the This Is Us t-shirts on sale. In the Welcome Center, stop by there, pick up one, represent fellowship, represent that this is us, and just uh, just, just show your love. So back to this weekend. So I wanted to take a look at an experience, a moment in the life of Jesus that changed a man forever. And it, it, if you've read the Bible, you understand this is not an uncommon theme. I believe there's account after account of people who have experienced a transformation through Christ's love within the pages of Scripture and throughout history. We see, when we come into contact with God, we change. When we, Christ, we encounter Christ, we change. And I hope that as we unpack some of this lesson, that we can apply it to our own lives. I want us to walk through this passage in order to get an idea of what a transformed life looks like. There's a transformative power that exists when we come into this relationship with Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ wants to save us through his death on the cross. I believe there is a heaven, and I believe there is a hell. And his death on the cross, I believe if we accept him as our Savior, we, we can spend eternity with him in heaven and avoid hell. But I also believe that Christ, Christ's love compels us to live differently. You see, when, when we meet Christ, we open our lives up and we begin this supernatural transformation that when fostered will change our lives forever. So here's kind of the question we're getting at today is, does your life look different since you met Jesus? For those of us that have a profession of faith, those of us that have put our trust in Jesus, that we said, we're all in Christ, I'm all yours, does our life look different? Can people in our lives see that there's a difference? Do we reflect a difference? Do we live a different life? Maybe, I'll go out on a limb, maybe this morning here, this is the first time you're going to hear of this man, Jesus. And what he's done for us on the cross is he went to the cross and he bore the weight of our sins in order for us to have a relationship with him. And maybe this is the first time you've heard that and you need to enter into a relationship with him. And we invite you to do that. But once we enter into this relationship with him, we'll never be the same. So I invite you, if that's you, to just jump into the deep end. And wherever you're at in your relationship with Christ, we just get messy and we dump into the deep end and we understand what it is to have this transformation going on in our life. Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 1, says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short, being, but because he was short, sorry, I get the song in my head, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see Jesus since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So I don't know about you, but every time I hear the story of Zacchaeus, if you've been raised in the church, and I was raised in the church, there's this silly song about Zacchaeus. And it's like Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Okay, so my mind immediately goes to Zacchaeus was like a hobbit <laughs> or an Oompa Loompa. Okay, I don't know why, maybe it's just I'm twisted. So we have a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as our Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And we teach kids this motion. We say, as, as our Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus. 
come thee down, son. You know, we get this finger pointing God. But when I read the scripture, I don't see a finger pointing God, but what I see is love going to Zacchaeus. Hey, man, I want to spend some time with you. I want to hang out with you. And I don't know about you, in, in the observations I see here, one of the things that really sticks out is the love of God. And God wants to spend time with sinners. So here we have Jesus going, I'm hanging out with the sinners. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that Christ chose to hang out with sinners. Because I know I'm one of them. So as I get into the text this morning, I understand I'm not pointing fingers at Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus, man, get your act together. I'm pointing fingers at myself going, dude, where are you at in this process, this transformation? Because see, transformation doesn't stop. Once we come into this relationship with Jesus, it doesn't say, we're done. We're on this pattern that we should be transforming our hearts to become more like Christ each and every day. Good enough is never good enough. There's always more that God wants to do in us and through us and around us. And sometimes we get complacent and sit back and say, I've done enough. So as we look at this, I just want to look at it through the lens of what did Zacchaeus do? What was he wrestling with? What was going on in his life? And why did this transformation have to happen? So here's the thing. Zacchaeus had some issues. This brother had some issues. He was messed up. But which one of us isn't? We, we all have issues. Check this out. In verse 2, it says, There was a man by the name of Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. So this puts Zacchaeus socially on the outside just from his responsibility as a tax collector. See, generally, the tax collectors would skim off the top in order to fill their own pockets. And since Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, he had all the other tax collectors working under. So not only were they skimming, he was skimming off of them. And so socially, they're like, that's a Zacchaeus dude, man. He's ripping us off. So socially, they're already pushing him aside. We ain't got time for Zacchaeus. He's the tax collector. Fooey on him. But it also says he was wealthy. And you got to understand why they put that in there because he made his wealth off of the backs of the people. These people went to work. They got taxed. Zacchaeus lined his pocket. So here he has all this wealth that he's accumulated, but at the cost of the people. He said that he wanted to see Jesus. Now, I wonder how many of us here want to see Jesus. I mean, like, do we really want to see Jesus? Are we just here for the weekend religion part? Or are we here for the relationship part? Are we here because we have a relationship with Jesus? And we want to see Jesus. We want to grow in this relationship. We want to see what he's going to do in our life. Zacchaeus had heard about this man named Jesus. Zacchaeus had heard what Zacchaeus knew was that Jesus was passing through town to town, and he was forgiving sins, and he was healing people. And Zacchaeus being on the outside said, I want to see this Jesus. I want to know this Jesus. I want to have a relationship with Jesus. But it said is, he was also a small man. And I wonder, how small do you have to be for them to point that out in Scripture? I mean, to, to make an account that he was a small man. I wonder if it was one of those things where they were so upset with who Zacchaeus was that they just had to point out, dude, he's, he's short. I'm just going to add that in for all of history. Zacchaeus was a small man. I mean, we're talking like the kind of guy that if he pulled his socks up, would go blind. We're talking a small man. Okay? Are you with me? He could sit on the floor and dangle his feet. Short man. Small man. So here's the problem. The crowd got in the way. Being a small man, the crowd gets in the way. There's not much he can do. And so Zacchaeus has to take some action. So in verse 4 it says, so he ran... And he climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus. That's undignified right there. In this society, in this culture, men ain't running through the streets. And they certainly aren't climbing trees. You know, such undignified behavior indicates there's more than just curiosity at play here. It wasn't that Zacchaeus is sitting back going, yeah, I've heard about this Jesus. Maybe if I get a chance. He's saying, this is my shot. This is my opportunity. Here comes Jesus. And in order for me to see this Jesus, I've got to leave this crowd. I've got to take some action. I've got to do something to get to see him. I have to become undignified. Zacchaeus knew that Christ was nearby and that in his miserable state, he wanted something different. This desire to be different was enough to convince Zacchaeus that he needed to do something different. Something possibly embarrassing to connect with the Savior. 
So here we have a grown man running and climbing a tree. I can't speak for you, but unless I'm at a lumberjack competition, anytime I see a grown man running and climbing a tree, that gets my attention. That's something I want to see. If I were at the park today and some dude just took off across the park and started climbing a tree, I'm like, that dude's climbing a tree. And here's where my curiosity and my sickness comes in. I'm going, I bet he'll fall. <laughs> and so now you got my attention. I'm going, this dude's climbing a tree. Men ain't supposed to be climbing a tree. When I was a kid, I could climb trees like the best of them. In my state now, you don't want to see me climbing a tree. <laughs> There's the visual for you all. Y'all just put that in your... But Zacchaeus knew. See, Zacchaeus knew that, that this was his shot. He's been on the outside so long. He's been an outcast so long. You know, he's made his money, but that wasn't enough. He's outcasted. But this is his opportunity to meet the Savior. That's someone he wanted to see because he was forgiven sins. And so he had to do some odd stuff to get notice. But this is the really cool part. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. When Jesus reached the spot, and all that was going on, all that was happening that day, all the crowd that was there, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. It says he just looked up. Instead of being focused on the things around him or being focused on the task at hand, understand he's on his way to the cross. He's, he's going from town to town on his way to the cross, understanding what's in front of him, understanding the task that's ahead of him. He took the time to look up. See, love looked up into the tree. Uh, love did not keep his focus only on what was in front of him. Christ looked up. And Christ looked up at, at those on the fringe, those that were the outcasts, those that were hurting, and he called out saying to him, there's hope, and that hope is in me. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down. And, and it says that immediately Zacchaeus came down. It didn't say he heard the call of Christ and said, you know, when I have the time, I'll follow that. It doesn't say he heard the call of Christ and said, God, I want to get everything together. And when I have it all together, then I'll follow you. It says immediately. Immediately he got down and he came and he said, the people saw this and began to mutter. Jesus is going to be the guest of a sinner. I wonder how often we mutter when we see Christ at work. How often we go, I, 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 he's doing what through who? Uh, why would he, uh, do we really think they're capable do you see what's going on? I mean, Jesus is hanging out with sinners. How dare him? But if it weren't for Jesus hanging out for sinners, I'd never know him. Jesus loves the sinner. So here's what happened. A life gets changed, but Zacchaeus stood up and said right then, as they're muttering, as they're complaining, look, he's hanging out with sinners. He says, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions. To the poor half of everything I have, it goes to the poor i don't need it because i got you now jesus he says if i've cheated anybody out of anything i'll pay back four times the amount not not only will i pay back what i've cheated you i'm going to pay back with interest i'm going to give back this is repentance this is where the life has done a 180 and zacchaeus is no longer who he used to be because he met the savior and he's changed and he's done this 180 and he's gone back and now he's going look i want to make it right Christ made it right in his life for salvation. Now he wants to make it right with the people around him. He says, there are people around me that I've got to make it right with. And Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus' actions, Jesus reached the spot where Zacchaeus was. He looked up and immediately this life's changed. You see this transformation happen. So here's the question. Does your life look different? Since you came into this relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about a religion that will have us here weekend after weekend. I'm talking about a relationship that's ongoing every day. Does your life look different since meeting this Jesus? Three points of application. The first one is this. Love finds us. Love finds us. Love finds us where we are, no matter where we are, who we are, what we're pursuing. It says this, for the Son of Man came and to seek and to save 
the lost. The, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Are we awake here? Hello? Are you excited that Jesus Christ came to seek you and to save you? Hello? We're the, okay, I want to make sure because I'm getting geeked. I'm excited. Jesus sought me and he saved me. He found me. I, I, I've been in ministry long enough to know that God doesn't wait until we get our act together to pursue us. He's chasing after our hearts right now. Where we're at. He wants us. He desires to have a relationship with us. Christ finds us right where we are in the midst of all our chaos and all of our crud. And Christ calls us to be a part of this incredible plan that he's established since the beginning of time. The truth is, we were never lost. We were never lost. Scripture tells us that God knew us and he formed us. See, we're not here by chance. See, Christ's love calls us into this personal growing relationship that has us wanting to serve Christ greater than serving ourselves. But here's what we do. We chase after the things of this world instead of the creator of this world. See, to Christ, wealth doesn't matter. Rich or poor, God looks... Uh, God love, God's love looks beyond what we may think is important. Jesus didn't care if Zacchaeus was wealthy. Jesus didn't look up and say, Zacchaeus, you've got the wealth that I need. I could use you, Zacchaeus, because you're loaded. See, Zacchaeus spent his life acquiring worldly wealth, but he lacked Jesus. And Jesus just looked at him and said, I want to spend time with you. I want to hang out with you. If Zacchaeus were alive today, he'd probably be the type of guy who'd be working hard to overcome both his social status and his physical stature. With all the money he had, he, he could never overcome his height or his social status. But to Christ, wealth didn't matter. Physical appearance didn't matter. Zacchaeus was short, and he need, we, we need to overcome these boundaries that we, we put up between us and God. We, we keep building these boundaries saying, if only I had this, if only I did that, you know, I'd be good enough. Well, folks, we're already good enough. We're already good enough. We were good enough when Christ went to the cross. And so we need to overcome these boundaries that keep us from experiencing a relationship with Christ, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual. We all have issues. We all have stuff. And what does it mean to overcome these boundaries? It doesn't mean that, that, that we'll never have stuff there. What it means is that we seek a way of overcoming these obstacles. We overcome obstacles when we believe that Christ is big enough, powerful enough, and loving enough to help us through whatever stands in our way. Now, that's the kind of Christ that I believe in. I believe in a Christ who's, who's big enough, powerful enough, and loving enough to help me get through whatever is standing in my way. I love the idea of a big God because if my God were small, if my Christ were small, that I could just condense him and put him in my pocket and take him out on the weekends. That's not a Christ big enough to worship. And when I worship God, when I worship Christ, I want a God so big that I don't understand everything about him, that, that I'm amazed by him, that I'm turned upside down by him. I want a God so big that my problems are nothing to him. I have a family member that was in a car accident when he was younger. The accident caused uh, some minor brain damage and left him with some physical scars uh, that he has to live with the rest of his life. See, his left arm was left paralyzed because of the accident, because the, the being hit by the car, it, it paralyzed his left arm. And at eight years old, he was no longer able to use that arm. So he's growing up the rest of his life, struggling with his stuff. But there were moments in his life where he said, I can and I will. And so I saw him play baseball. I saw him actually go out for football and run track. But as he got older, it seems like things got more and more complicated. And all of a sudden, he started developing this attitude that boiled down to two words. And they were this, I can't. And pretty sure his mantra became, I can't. You know, everything he would face was, well, I can't. And he'd sort of like, I can't. And then I wonder, imagine, if Zacchaeus used an I can't attitude in his pursuit of Christ, the, the crowds are getting thicker, and before long Zacchaeus can no longer see the road in front of him. More and more people are now standing between him and Jesus. So Zacchaeus decides to go to Starbucks, grab a Frappuccino, maybe read about it, figure it's not my time. 
If Christ wants me, he'll pursue me. I can't right now. And I wonder how many of us sit here this morning with an I can't attitude. Like maybe God's put something on our heart. God's called us to something. Or something big is right there. And there's an obstacle between you and, and what he's calling you to. And we're facing it. And we're going, uh, it's just too big. I can't. You know, I, I don't know if I can overcome what I've been through. I don't know if God can really use me. I can't. Instead of believing in your can't, what if we started believing in God's cans? What if we started believing that he can and he's capable of? He's mightier than you in anything we face. He's able to overcome whatever we face. See, here's the truth. All have sinned. Everyone in this room and beyond in the world, we all have sin. We all have obstacles. We all have things in our lives that we need to overcome. But God can. And see, God knows us and the condition we're in. And our condition is not a challenge to God. He finds us how we are, and he's already chosen to use us. So instead of focusing on our inability, our struggles, may we need to focus more on who Christ is and that he overcame death because he loves you and he loves me and desires this relationship in our lives. And it's not just fire insurance, but he desires to grow in and through us and transform us to who he's called us to be. You see, God's not ashamed to be associated with us. No matter what we carry, no matter what we have, no matter what hurts or roadblocks, he's not associated to be with us no matter how he found us. God also doesn't want us to stay in the condition that he found us in. He wants to transform us into what he calls us to be. Second thing is just that. Love calls us. Love calls us. Love calls us to move beyond. Christ's love compels us to move beyond the obstacles we presently see. Zacchaeus saw the crowd. And Zacchaeus needed to run ahead of the crowd. Sometimes we need to leave the crowd to see who this Jesus really is. Like Zacchaeus, I believe a lot of us get lost in the crowd when it comes to following Jesus. It's like we connect our own spiritual journey onto the journey of our friends or our peers. If our friends are experiencing Christ, we feel as if we're experiencing Christ. You know, if they're going through something, we're going through something. If our friends are not experiencing Christ, however, then sometimes neither are we. We, we hitch our relationship with Christ onto the crowd that we hang out with. Instead of understanding that our relationship is a personal, individual thing. See, I believe we, we should surround ourselves with other Christians who are passionately seeking to follow Christ. That's why I, I believe that everyone here should be involved in a life group. I believe our life groups are full of passionate people that want to help you live out a biblical life. A life according to God's word, not according to the world's way. It's about that significant Christian relationship where we're pouring into one another and challenge one another to say, Are you living according to God's word? Are you being transformed through your relationship with Christ? Life groups are designed to connect you to that significant Christian relationship that will encourage you to be transformed, to grow in your faith. And so, you know, many of you may be in life groups, and I'm going to challenge you, do something undignified, do something out of the norm, get crazy, maybe start leading a life group. You know, what if our people that are sitting became leaders? What if those that are on the fringe became involved? You know, it might be crazy to encourage you to step out. But it was also crazy for Zacchaeus to leave the crowd. Because we like it in the crowd. We're comfortable in the crowd. You know, we can hide in the crowd. You know, anytime there's volunteers, we love to be in the crowd so that we don't have to make eye contact. We say, hey, we need some nursery workers. And it was like, <laughs> that's for someone else. Don't make eye contact or I'll be changing diapers. We like the crowd. You know, I don't, I don't have to have my identity in the crowd. I can just go along with the flow. But see, love calls us out of the crowd. Here's the deal. Christ knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you're afraid of. He knows what he's called you to. Our job is to be faithful to the call. Our job is to step out of the crowd and say, okay, God, here I am. You, use me, Lord. What, what a powerful, dangerous few words. Use me, Lord. I'm here. I'm all in. What you have, where you call, I'll go. That's dangerous because that'll turn your world upside down. 
that, that'll change your status. That'll, you know, that'll change your zip code. That'll change your relationships. We say, I'm all in. Father, use me. That'll change your relationships. That'll change everything. It'll turn upside down. And I, I'm just crazy enough to believe that this is what God calls us to. See, in Scripture, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples. And I wonder how many of us are willing to well, go. You know, we like the idea of being transformed. We like the idea of a relationship with Christ. But when it comes to actually, you know, rubber hitting the road, it's like, okay, go make disciples. Uh, no. I'm comfortable in the crowd. I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm comfortable hanging out here because it's safe here. I don't have to be seen here. I, I don't have to be out there on the limb like Zacchaeus. I, I'm comfortable right here where I'm at. You're asking me to go do something crazy. Uh, no, I'm good. Good right here. Doing my thing. But then I wonder. I, I wonder what our communities would look like. I wonder what our, our neighborhoods would look like if we passionately you know, left these doors, walked out these doors and said, you know what? God, use me. God, transform me that my neighbors can know you. Transform me that my community will know you. Transform me that this town will know you. That, that's turning a world upside down. What, what if we say, God, yes, use me. I'm stepping out of the crowd. I'm going out on a limb here. Use me. Transform me. Lord, whatever roadblocks in my way, remove it because you're big enough. God, you're bigger than anything that stands in my way. Zacchaeus had heard of Christ. And I believe in his social struggle, he had to get beyond that. And love called him and changed him. So Zacchaeus developed a new reputation. In this moment of transformation, instead of being wealthy... He became heir to the throne, the child of the king of the universe. Instead of being short, he became perfect, perfect for this world and for all of eternity. See, his height wasn't an issue. His faith was the issue. And instead of being a face in the crowd, he became a standout. All the faces in the crowd that day, Christ hung out with Zacchaeus. The last point is this, love changes us. See, when we, we, we come into this relationship with Christ, it changes us. We cannot go back to who we used to be. We have to keep pressing forward to who he's called us to be. Zacchaeus there in verse 8, you know, as they were muttering, stood up and said, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay it back. This is the picture of transformation. This is that repentant heart of saying, I, I, I'm turning from how I was. I no longer want to be that person. I'm going to be somebody new. I want to be transformed, Lord. And it's only through you that I have the power to be transformed. And the picture of who he was to who he has become since meeting Jesus is that picture of him letting go of what he thought was important holding on to what he now realizes is important. So I wonder in the busyness of our lives, as we, we, we go through everything we go through, as we're focused on you know, what we have to do in life, and, you know, we've got people sitting here right now that are thinking about what they have to accomplish this afternoon, what they have to accomplish tomorrow, and then tomorrow they're going to be thinking what they have to accomplish tomorrow. In the busyness, they're just focused on what's in front of them. Church, what if we took the time and through the love that Christ has poured into us, we took the time and simply looked up. Looked at the fringe. Looked at those that are hurting and outcast. Those are waiting to be loved. Those are saying, I'm here and I want to be relevant. I want to be important. I just want to be noticed. And what if in our busyness we sort of just took the focus off ourselves and just looked at the fringe? What if we followed the patterns of Christ and we looked up. See, 24 years ago, I was just a kid attending service. I, I had that fire insurance I talked about. I accept Jesus as my Lord because I didn't want to go to hell. But I really hadn't stepped out. I really hadn't, you know, <laughs> ministry, no way. Speaking in churches ain't going to happen. Praying? Eh, I don't know how to pray. 
But what I knew how to do in that moment, when somebody called me, when, when you know, the pastor said, we need some help. Okay. I can do that. Because something in my spirit said, you know what? You're capable. Step out. Uh, but I'm not qualified. Well, you don't have to be qualified to follow Jesus. You just have to be obedient to follow Jesus. So I stepped out and I took that step. And I took the next step. I took the next step and the next step and the next step. And I don't know what steps are ahead of me, but here's what I know. Each and every one of us sitting here this morning has another step. See, this transformation process doesn't stop. This goes into our last breath. We're not done being transformed to being like Christ. We're not done being transformed to be more like Him. But here's what we do. We say, enough is enough. I'm good enough doing what I'm doing. Well, people around us are dying and going to hell. We're good enough. We have the answer, but we're good enough. Church, where are you at? Is your life look different since you met this Christ? Are you living a life that's different? Are you stepping out? Are you growing in your faith? Do you understand who this Christ is that called you? So what's your transformation story? Have you met this Christ? Has he forgiven you? Because all you have to do is ask. Has he set you free? Well, what about those you run with, your crowd? Are they encouraging you? Are, they, are, you, are you feeling empowered to serve Christ as you were designed? Are you stepping out? Or are you still stuck in a crowd that doesn't care? See, when Jesus called Zacchaeus down, here's the cool thing is that he responded immediately. And that I, I believe all of us have to respond immediately because the minute we say, I'll do it later, later never comes. It's like we keep pushing it off. But when it comes to our relationship with Christ, he says, you know, he's calling us. He loves us. He finds us. He wants to change us. And sometimes it's us just immediately responding to that call. And we all have that next step, that next step in that call of love. 